For many interested in Ireland's railways, the story of the country's once extensive network of narrow gauge lines ended with the closure in 1961 of CIE's last three foot gauge line, the West Clare. There was poetry in the very names of the old narrow gauge companies the Skull and Skibbereen, the Cork and Muskery, the Clogher Valley, the Tralee and Dingle. The reliquary for the surviving artefacts of the Irish narrow gauge is the magnificent railway gallery of the Ulster Folk and Transport Museum at Coltra in County Down, on the shores of Belfast Law. These locomotives, coaches and rail cars, which have survived both the ravages of time and the attentions of the scrap merchants, have been lovingly restored and conserved as tangible reminders of the days before the unstoppable progress of the car, the bus and the lorry tipped the always precarious financial condition of these lines from being just about sustainable to that of lost causes. Today, going on 40 years after the closure of the West Clare, narrow gauge railways are still active throughout Ireland. Our journey in search of the Irish narrow gauge today will take us from here at Coltra in the northeast to the shores of Tralee Bay in the southwest. And we will uncover a range of lines as varied in their own way as the old companies were at the turn of the century. The first three foot gauge tracks in Ireland were in County Antrim. They were laid high into the hills in the north of the county to transport iron ore from mines scarcely viable even when the railways were being built to the east coast for shipment to the ironworks across the Irish Sea and that part of England which is today known as Cumbria. It is appropriate, therefore, that we start our journey in the county of Antrim, at Shane's Castle, on the northern shores of Loch Ney. Though this pioneering recreation of the Irish narrow gauge, which ran from 1971 to 1995, is no longer open to the public, we were able to observe the stock which formerly worked on the line being shunted in conjunction with the movement of one of its steam engines to a new home. The locos are number one, an 040 packet tank dating from 1904, used by British Aluminium around their works at Larne, and number three, one of a trio of well tanks built by Barclays in 1949 for board Namona, the Irish peat board. The diesel locomotive shunting the stock is a simplex, built as recently as 1976. The 060 steam locomotive Nancy, built by Avonside in Bristol in 1908 for use at ironstone quarries in Leicestershire, was never fully restored to running condition at Shane's Castle. It has been acquired by the Cavan and Leitrim Railway and is seen here loaded onto a lorry for transportation to the CNL base at Drummond. Much work will need to be done and a new boiler will have to be constructed before Nancy can steam again. Apart from the northeast of Ulster, the Industrial Revolution of the 18th and 19th centuries barely touched Ireland. The country never had the multiplicity of industrial railway systems found in Britain. The one exception to this was the peat industry, which, as we will see, even today, is a major user of light railways. One of the first peat railways in Ireland was developed in the early years of the 20th century by the Irish Peat Development Company on the southern shores of Loch Ney. Relics of this railway, which was operated by electric locomotives, their power supplied by the company's own peat-fired generating station, can still be found amongst the vegetation, which has grown up since the system was abandoned in the 1960s. On part of the site, a new country park has been developed by Northern Ireland's Department of the Environment and a new railway has been created to take visitors around the park. The Education Officer of Peatlands Park, Jenny Fuller, takes up the story. Peatlands Park was originally owned by a family called the Verners. It was part of a huge big estate called the Churchill Estate. Uh, they owned the land up until 1901 when a large portion was sold off to a company called the Irish Peat Development Company. Now they would have cut turf uh, throughout the park mainly for export to the UK as animal bedding. Uh, that 
continued until the 1960s. And at that stage, there was a very poor market for peat products. So Irish Peat Development Company were looking for a buyer. And in 1978, the government bought the land. And the park is now owned and managed by the Department of the Environment. Well, the Irish Peat Development Company installed a, an hour gauge railway for extracting the peat uh, from the park. And that would have been here while they were in operation. But obviously then it fell into disuse. When Peatlands Park was opened then to the public, and uh, officially opened in 1989, uh, part, of the, part of the railway, uh, the, a new railway was put in. Uh, it doesn't follow the exact lines of the old railway, railway, but it's in keeping with the history of the park. The train is hauled by a new four-wheel diesel hydraulic locomotive, specially built for the line in 1993 by Alan Keefe, the locomotive engineers based at Ross and Y. In the 1950s, when electrical operation on the original line ended, two diesels took over, a German-built Schoma dating from 1955 and a planet type supplied in 1954. It is pleasing to record that these two locomotives are still here and in working order, a link between today's Peatlands Park and its previous existence as a busy industrial system. The Peatlands Park is well worth a visit. It provides a wonderful introduction to the magic of Ireland's extensive peatlands. Located close to the southern shore of Loch Ney, the biggest freshwater lake in these islands, on the boundary between counties Tyrone and Armagh, it is only a few minutes' drive from Ulster's M1 motorway, from which it is clearly signposted. Apart from the railway, there are walks and nature trails, a visitor centre and a shop. There is more to the peatlands of Ulster than just an interesting diversion for visitors. A few hundred yards down the road from the peatlands park, a large pile of milled peat is seen by the roadside. Through this anonymous motorway bridge, over which thunders the traffic on the busy M1, lies Ulster's newest Norgage line, which is being developed by the Sunshine Peat Company. This is another part of the networks of bogs which were once worked by the Irish Peat Development Company. The bog stretched from near Anachmore Station on the Great Northern Railway Line from Portadown to Derry. And as a young boy, the present owner of the Sunshine Peat Company, Errol Stafford, was bitten by the railway bug. The milled peat here is used for horticultural purposes and is scooped up by these ingenious machines called monovacs, which literally suck up the peat using the same principle as the domestic vacuum cleaner. The peat is then stored in stockpiles from where it is taken away for processing. At present, lorries have to be brought into the bog to take out the peat, but in a wonderful and all too rare example of rail taking over from road, Errol Stafford plans to lay two foot six inch gauge lines through his bogs to bring the peat to the loading point, where the lorries can take over to bring it on to the processing plant. The locos and wagons acquired for use on the line are ex Ministry of Defence equipment. The first length of track has been laid and the Hunsland locomotive is now being used to run works trains to extend the line. Railway will in time be relayed throughout the bog and will convey the peat under the motorway bridge to a loading point beyond. This historic location in the development of the Irish peat industry will soon see a working railway back in business.
The extensive peatlands on the northern shores of Loch Ney already see Norgage railways in everyday use on the sites operated by the Danish owned enterprise, the Bullrush Peat Company. We visited two of the bogs, or as they're known in these parts, mosses, where railways are active. The first of these adjoins the company's factory at New Ferry, close to the River Ban near Balahi in County Londonderry. The locomotives used are German built Shomas. The wagons have been constructed by the company itself. Once the environs of the factory have been cleared, the tracks divide and carry on down either side of the moss. Wagons are loaded by excavators, and when full, the train reverses back towards the factory. The other site where railways are in use is near Randallstown, not far from Shane's Castle, which we visited earlier. Here the Monovacs are busily scooping up the peat. A Shoma diesel brings a loaded train in from the moss towards the loading point. As this location is quite some distance from the Bullrish factory, the peat has to be loaded onto articulated lorries for the journey there. The wagon behind the locomotive is a slave unit. Its wheels are driven by hydraulics from the locomotive to provide both extra traction and braking power. A small simplex diesel takes over and shunts the loaded wagons up to the tippler. Once the wagons are in place, a winch is connected to the train and the local driver retires to the control cabin on top of the structure carrying the conveyor belts which will fill the lorries. The winch is controlled remotely and draws the wagons towards the tippler where they are automatically unloaded. The peat falls onto the conveyor belt, the end of which can be moved to ensure that the capacity of the lorries is fully used and their load is evenly distributed. Norgage railways are used by the Bullrish Company not for any reasons of sentiment, but because their tracks spread the weight over the spongy and unstable bog. They are the most efficient and cost-effective way of moving the peat. Even if it was practical to do so, which is questionable, it would cost a great deal more to build roads to enable heavy lorries to get to where the peat is being produced, in the heart of the moss. Perhaps the most famous of Ireland's narrow gauge railways, and certainly the biggest in terms of mileage operated, was the County Donegal. Three groups are working to revive the memory of this fine railway, which closed in 1959. Derry was once served by a branch of the County Donegal, which terminated at Victoria Road, on the east bank of the Foyle, which bisects the city. The Foyle Valley Railway Centre has been established on the site of the Old Great Northern Station, at Foyle Road, on the west bank of the river. CDR locomotive No. 4 Mean Glass has been partially cosmetically restored, and sits outside as an advertisement for the centre. Inside the museum is sister locomotive No. 6 Column Kill, built by Naismith Wilson in 1907, and other items of CDR rolling stock, including one of the red vans, which were hauled by the system's rail cars. A surviving CDR carriage has also been beautifully restored. Services on the Foyle Valley Railway are currently provided by two restored CDR rail cars. The one in the lead here is number 18, which first entered service in 1940. The Donegal rail cars had an engine unit which was articulated from the passenger saloon behind. The driving wheels in the tractor unit are joined with coupling rods. When the rail car is operating, these rods give out a distinctive clanking sound.
the real cars head out from the terminus. Their three foot gauge tracks laid on the track bed of the old Great Northern Line. Here they are passing a site which has been cleared for a new depot and workshop. The line follows a picturesque course along the banks of the River Foyle. At present the tracks run for about three miles. Track laying is continuing and before long CDR vehicles will actually once again be running in County Donegal, albeit through a part of the county where they never ventured in their heyday. The aim of the Foyle Valley Railway is to get at least as far as Carrigan's, which was the first station out of Derry on the Old Great Northern Line. The old rail car in use is number 12, which dated from 1934. The first phase of these rail cars built specifically for the CDR. When they were in regular service, the rail cars had to be turned like a steam engine at the end of each as they could be driven from one end only. As there is no turntable on the Foyle Valley line, the rail cars work coupled back to back, one hauling the other alternately. Offering a well presented museum, the chance to travel in beautifully restored CDR rail cars a pleasant run beside the River Foyle, the Foyle Valley Railway is a must for anyone interested in the narrow gauge railways of Ireland. The County Donegal Railway Restoration Society was founded some years ago with the aims of conserving as much CDR stock as could be found and ultimately rebuilding a stretch of the old railway. The Society's efforts to date have been concentrated on the CDR station in Donegal Town, which has been transformed from a near ruinous wreck to the splendid museum and heritage centre it is today. I asked the Society's project director, Patrick Stewart, when they took possession of the station. Uh, about two and a half years ago, I, the building was derelict and, and CIE were very generous to allow us into the building and we completely refurbished it with a museum downstairs, a railway museum downstairs, and our offices, society office above. Uh, it surprises me the, the amount, the interest worldwide in the Donegal society, from Australia to America to England, and, and Ireland, obviously Ireland. Uh, we've got about 400 membership throughout the world uh, in this society. Some of them very generous towards the society indeed, and do a lot of work, especially the people from the UK, do a lot of work for the society. In addition to the display of Ruiana, the Heritage Centre has a wonderful model of Donegal Town Station in its heyday. The ultimate aim of the society is to relay some track and once again have narrow gauge trains running from the station. Wheel car number 15, 264 tank number 6 Drumbo have been secured and await restoration. Together with brake coach number 28, already restored and currently on display outside the station, they will form the nucleus of stock for the new line. The first part of the County Donegal Railway to close was the 24 mile long branch from Stranora to Glenties, which had opened in 1895. The line lost its scheduled passenger and goods services in December 1947, though occasional special goods and livestock trains ran up to March 1952 when the line was finally abandoned. Fintown Station in this branch was 16 miles from Stranorder and 8 miles from Glenties. Here the line ran along the shore of Loch Finn, and today Fintown is the starting point for an ambitious scheme to rebuild the railway on the former track bed from Fintown towards Glenties. Passengers are conveyed in one of the three trailers which began life on a tramway in Charleroi in Belgium. These vehicles came to Fintown via the Shane's Castle Railway in County Antrim. The locomotive used in the passenger trains is a four-wheeled motor rail diesel hydraulic which also came from Shane's Castle. The tram cars have been repainted in the red and cream livery 
off the County Donegal Railways. The setting of the Fintown Line is the most spectacular of any of the projects to restore sections of the Irish Narra Gauge. Truck laying is forging ahead. A Ruston diesel locomotive has been acquired from board Namona and is used to power the works trains. Fine summer's day, a run along the well laid track by the shores of Buck Finn, with the spectacular scenery drifting past the windows, is an experience to cherish. Not far from Fintown, near the town of Glenties itself, is another operating Norgage railway, but one of a completely different nature to the Fintown line. The bogs here at Kilran were formerly owned and operated by Bode Namona, but in recent years control has passed to the Glenties Turf Co-op. The co-op is engaged in the production of salt peat for domestic use. The distinctive smell of a turf fire is still common in rural Ireland. Wagons filled with salt peat cut out on the bog are brought to the tip head by one of the Ruston diesels on the system. They are shunted the last few yards to the unloading point manually. What distinguishes the Glenty system is its gauge. This is the last former Board Namona location to use two foot gauge railways. One of the locomotives heads out towards the bog, passing a sea of bog cotton gently rippling in the breeze. The only notable engineering feature on the system is the bridge spanning the river o &A.
The bogs and the railways at Glanties, now locally managed and self-contained, producing relatively small tonnages of sawed peat for customers in the area, are a reminder of how the peat industry used to be in the years after the last war, when even the power stations of that era burned sawed peat, like that produced at Glanties. Today, Borden and Mona operates over 1,000 miles of narrow gauge railways in the Irish Republic. Though by far the greatest part of the board's railway activity is concentrated in its peat energy division, which produces millions of tonnes of milled peat annually for use in power stations, in some places the old methods still survive. Coolnagan in County West Meath is a board and a facility in transition. As the demand for the traditional sawed peat lessens, new rules are being sought for locations such as this. the gun, which still has ample reserves of peat, a major investment programme will be undertaken in the next few years, which will refocus activity away from the production of sawed peat to that of peat for horticultural purposes. In the meantime, Coolnagun continues to cut sawed peat for domestic and commercial customers in the area. Coolnagun also produces nuggets of peat for use by the board's environmental division. This was set up in 1991 and has been at the forefront of new developments in pollution control systems ever since. At the tip head is a complex system of conveyors which feed machines which first crush the sawed peat and then grade it to produce peat nuggets of just the right size for the peat-based biofilters which have a variety of applications from the treatment of sewage effluent the cleaning up of air emissions from chemical plants to reduce both their odour and toxicity. Much of the humble sawed peat produced at Coolnagun and brought to the tip head on this railway system is actually destined for use in some of the most technologically sophisticated products produced by Board Namona. Much more typical of the railway activities of Borden and Mona are the long trains of milled peat which are conveyed daily to the electricity generating stations in the Midlands and west of Ireland. Up to 5 million tonnes of peat are moved annually on the over 1,000 miles of 3 foot gauge track operated by the board. Far from being a thing of the past, the Irish narrow gauge is alive and well and making a vital contribution to the economy of the Irish Republic. One of the biggest power stations is located at Shannon Bridge in County Offaly. Peat is drawn here from bogs on either side of the River Shannon. This impressive and specially built viaduct carries three foot gauge tracks across the river near the power station. Also on the Blackwater system at Shannon Bridge, is an opportunity for those interested in the peat railways of Borden and Mona to experience travel on the three foot gauge. The Clonmac Noise and West Offaly Railway provides conducted tours of the system in the luxury of specially built air conditioned rail coaches.
a nature reserve has been developed and visitors can learn something of the unique ecology of Ireland's peatlands. Like they can even try cutting peat the traditional and back-breaking way with the special spade used for this work, the slawn. A beautifully restored former Great Northern Railway bus pulls into the station yard at Drummond, the home of the Cavan and Leitrim Railway, which is becoming a must-see for visitors to County Leitrim. The bus has been acquired by the railway company to bring visitors to the line from the nearby town of Carrick and Shannon. The line steam locomotive number one, Dramad, is prepared for her day's work outside the engine shed. Each day before the railway can operate, the track must be inspected. The Wickham rail car is used for this purpose. The two bus carriages which will form the passenger train are at the platform. The track now extends out to Clun Colliery the first level crossing beyond Drummond Station. Dramad sets out on the first working of the day. Nancy, which we saw leaving Shane's castle at the start of the programme, has arrived safely at her new home. She is temporarily united with her nameplates for the benefit of the camera. Among the vehicles at Drummond is the former Isle of Man Railway's brake composite coach. The already completed first class compartment shows the high standard to which the coach is being restored. The Avon Leitrim Railway has been making good progress since the project began in 1993. Two steam locomotives and an interesting collection of diesels and rolling stock can now be seen at Drummond. Home welcome will await visitors to this now thriving centre for the Irish Norwich today. The windmill at Blennerville in County Kerry marks the present day terminus of another of the great names from the history of the Norgage Railways of Ireland, that of the Trillian Dingle. Part of this famous line from Blennerville to Balliard on the outskirts of Trillie has been rebuilt. Trains are hauled by the only surviving Trillian Dingle locomotive, 262 tank No. 5, built by Hanslet in 1892. When this line was finally closed in 1953, Number 5 was sent by CIE 
to the Cavan and Leitrim section, where it was in regular service until that line closed in March 1959. It was then purchased for preservation by a railroad museum in the United States, from whence it was repatriated in the early 1990s to its native Kerry. The logo runs around his train at the Balliard terminus. The carriages in use today came from a metre gauge line in northern Spain. Four were acquired but only two have been re-gauged and restored to date. Number five passes over the level crossing and heads back off towards Blennerville. The old trolley and dingle was famous for the sharp curves and ferocious gradients which its trains had to face as they made their way down the Dingle Peninsula. The section which has been rebuilt, unfortunately, is the flattest and least interesting part of the line, where flooding of the track bed by occasional high tides was the main problem encountered. Whilst lacking the atmosphere or the charisma which was associated with the original Trillian Dingle Railway, Longway No. 5 and its train puff happily along its track to remind visitors of the great days of the three-foot gauge in County Kerry. in Dingle, there was once another quite remarkable railway in Kerry. This was the Le Stole in Ballybunion, often called quite simply the Lartigue, after the French engineer who invented this unique monorail system. The line closed as long ago as 1924, but for the last 40 years, Michael Barry, who lives near Le Selton, which was one of the stopping places on the monorail, has been collecting scraps of metal and any other remains that he could find. Metal sleepers and parts of the A-frames, which supported the running rail, have been pieced together like the bits of an enormous jigsaw. The result is this restored 100-foot section of track and the rebuilt carriage which sits on it. The maker split is affixed to the carriage. Modern diesel and electric locomotives are still built at this site in Leicestershire. Looking at Michael Barry's reconstruction of the carriage, the reality of what travel on the Lartigue must have been like was brought home. Think of the noise that would have deafened the unfortunate passengers as they sat with their ears almost up against the running wheels in the middle of the carriage. Underneath the horizontal wheels balanced the vehicle against undue lateral movement. Oh, the ingenuity of it all and the folly! It is due to the single-minded determination of one man that these tangible reminders of Ireland's most singular railway survive over 70 years after the line closed. At Moyasta between Kilrush and Kilkee in County Clare, another of the great Norgay's lines of the west of Ireland is beginning to stir from its slumbers. The promoters have acquired from CIE the only surviving West Clare steam locomotive, number no. 5, Steve Callan, which sat for many years at a plinth at Ennis Station. The restoration of Steve Callan to working order will be a major job, but the steam locomotive is a durable old thing and many a lost cause has been triumphantly brought back to steam before now. The West Clare was immortalised in Percy French's outrageous ballad, Are You Right There, Michael, Are You Right?, which among other slanders declared that the permanent way was so queer, 
the train spent most of its time off the track. The eventual aim is to rebuild the railway from Kilkee to Kilrush. The long abandoned bridges and embankments along this part of Clare's coastline may yet echo to the joyous shrill of a steam locomotive's whistle. The longest established enthusiast run railway in Ireland is that which is located in the grounds of Stradbally Hall in County Leash. Constriction of the line which offers a round trip of about three quarters of a mile began in 1969. Trains have been operated ever since that time by the Irish Steam Preservation Society. The line steam locomotive is the former Bodnamona No. 2. The sister of the local we saw at Shane's Castle at the start of the programme. In 1997, the boiler and firebox were taken off for the loco to be overhauled. Just the rolling chassis and the cab remain at Stradbally. In the absence of steam, two interesting diesel locomotives are available to work trains on the line. Nippy is a four wheel diesel mechanical built by Hibbards in 1936. Originally in industrial use in England, Nippy came to Stradbally by the railway at Shane's Castle. The other diesel is a Ruston, dating from 1941, which had been in use at the power station at Port Arlington before going into active retirement at Stradbally. The buggy coach used on the railway was built on the shortened underframe of one of the original coaches supplied by the Metropolitan Carriage and Wagon Company for the opening of the Cavan and Leitrim Railway in 1887. It came to Straw Valley after service with Borden and Mona. The four-wheeled brake van, like Nippy, came from Shane's Castle. The gradient out of the station is steep enough to test the locomotives. Once away from the station, the line follows a pleasant circuit through the woods. Every year on the August Bank Holiday weekend, which in the Republic of Ireland is the first weekend of that month, Stradbally plays host to the National Traction Engine Rally. This is one of the best steam weekends you will find anywhere, with a wide variety of vintage vehicles and a friendly and hospitable atmosphere which is second to none. The two days of the rally are the busiest of the year for the railway, with everyone involved working hard to accommodate the many people who want to travel on the trains. The locomotives are put into their shed and another successful operating day at Strutbally comes to a close. As one door closes, another opens. Over the years, a number of miniature railways have operated in various parts of Ireland. To represent this part of the Irish narrow gauge today, we have come to Westport House in County Mayo, where a delightful 15-inch gauge line constructed by the English specialist in these railways, Severn Lamb, is one of the many attractions of this superb house and park, which are open to the public. The story of Westport House is best told by the man whose family have owned it for many generations, Lord Altamont. The house that you're looking at there is about 1778 and was uh, designed by James Wyatt, who is one of the world's most famous architects, who designed Westport House 
all the grounds around and the town of Westport, the principal streets of the town of Westport, and laid them out. The house is crammed to bursting with fantastic uh, works of art and uh, paintings and furniture, uh, most of which have a strong association really with, with the west of Ireland. And we've developed lots of attractions really for the family and particularly for children. We're very concerned. We feel if kids are happy, the parents are happy. One sure way to make the kids happy is to take them for a spin on the Westport Horse Express. <laughs> The track runs through the woods and past the boating lake on a circuit of about a mile. As befits a pleasure railway, the driver usually puts on a good show for the kids. At one point, the holy mountain of Croke Patrick, where St. Patrick himself is said to have prayed, is glimpsed across the lake from the train. The attractions at Westport House include the lake, the gardens, the children's zoo and the railway. It is a delightful and relaxing place to spend some time, with something for almost every taste on offer. Ruski is a quiet village beside the River Shannon on the main Dublin to Sligo Road. It is a popular overnight stopping place for boats cruising in the river. The village supermarket is beside the harbour, but in the garden behind the supermarket, one man's dream to build and operate his own private length of railway is being fulfilled. When he is not busy with the shop, David Cunningham is the master of the Ruski Harbour Railway. The track is two foot gauge and the locomotive is the oldest preserved Lister diesel in Ireland. It was supplied new to Fry's Chocolate Factory at Keynesham near Bristol in 1936, passing to Cadbury's when they took over from Fry's. It was sold for scrap in 1972, but was rescued by a firm specialising in narrow gauge railways. It eventually went to work for a peat company in Scotland and came to Ruski in September 1993. Coaches are older than the local. They were built in 1928 for the Lilish Hall Park and Woodland Railway in Shropshire. When this closed in 1939, they were put in store, emerging again for use at the famous Alton Towers in Staffordshire in 1952. The coaches came to Risky in 1996. In addition to building his line, and collecting the great many ruby artefacts which are on display. David Cunningham has taken a particular interest in conserving items relating to the mines at Oregna, where there was a long history of iron smelting and coal mining going back to the 18th century. It was the traffic from the coal mines at Oregna which kept the Calvert and Leitrim Railway in business up to 1959. Mining at Arigna was conducted by driving adits into the hillside. The coal was brought out on four-wheel trucks or hutches, as they were known in the locality. Each mine used a different gauge to stop competitors pinching their hutches. 
David Cunningham's work in preserving these tangible reminders of the industrial archaeology of Haredna and its mines is to be commended. The Risky Harbour Railway is not normally open to the public, but David is happy to show visitors round by prior arrangement. The Curra of Kildare is famed for its race course and the raising of thoroughbreds. It has also long been Ireland's version of Salisbury Plain, the location of the major concentration of military activity in the country. After independence, the Irish army took over from the British. By 1909, a railway had been established to bring targets out to the ranges of the Curra. Originally worked by horsepower, the present locomotive, a 1926 built simplex, which had seen service at Baldonnell Airdrome, came to the Curra in the 1950s. The railway is used to this day as the most efficient way of bringing targets out to the firing ranges. The targets which have to be brought back to have their many bullet holes repaired after every hour are loaded onto the two trucks. The local then hauls them out the mile or so to the range. The gauge of the railway is two foot. Originally, the railway served three firing ranges. Though lines to two of these have been lifted, the Engineering Corps of the Irish Army, which maintains the railway, plans to relay these tracks. The approach of the train causes a mini stampede among some of the many sheep who graze on the army lands of the Curra. Trains are invariably accompanied by this little dog. Despite his antics, he always manages to keep clear of the wheels. First of the targets is unloaded at the range. The locomotive proudly carries the badge of the engineers. Ireland's only military railway is still going strong after all these years. One of Bordnamona's Hunslet wagon masters hurries a train of sod peat towards Ballydemmit Works in County Kildare. The grit peat reserves for miles around here will soon be producing up to one and a half million tonnes of milled peat annually for a new power station which is being planned, a major development project backed by funding from the European Union. The 
The work to develop the railway infrastructure to service a new power station is already in hand. The stakes marking the route of a new double track three foot gauge line march across the bog. A bridge under the public road will be built at this point on the line and work on excavating the formation is already underway. Far from being a thing of the past, here the Norrigage Railway will be playing a vital role in providing the energy needs of the Ireland of the 21st century. This is the Irish Norrigage of tomorrow, preparing to enter its third century, and still going strong. <laughs>